Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see that so many people found their way here for day two. Uh, my name is Helge. I'll be the session chair for the first session today. And um, it's going to be about Galaxy in education. And um, we have five talks coming up. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Marisa Loach, who is a first year PhD student at the Open University. And um, she's going to tell us why we should use Galaxy in the first place. So please, Marisa. Yeah, hello. So I am a PhD student and I'm working on a project where I'm reanalyzing single cell RNA sequencing data from public repositories using Galaxy. But that's not actually what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about kind of the question that I've been asked a lot this year of why I'm using Galaxy and how I've kind of uh, added to my workload as a PhD student by performing my own review of these platforms so that I can actually have a good answer to give to people. Because the simple answer for me as to why I'm using Galaxy is that that's what my supervisor has told me to do. But I didn't think that that was really going to be an adequate response when I got to sort of my final uh, PhD viva. So I have decided to perform kind of a systematic review of platforms uh, that uh, let you run different tools and, uh, and create your own workflows. And I, I kind of found that there's not a huge amount of literature that compares these platforms in terms of the features that matter to me as kind of a student and a biologist who doesn't really have like a lot of programming experience. Like there's quite a few reviews that look at the technical sides of these platforms, sort of, you know, what sort of container systems do they use and what sort of programming languages and how do they manage computing resources? That is meaningless to me. Like as long as I can put my data in and get some results, I don't really need to know kind of behind the scenes what, how the tools are working. So I'm more interested in kind of what's it like to use these uh, platforms as kind of uh, you know a user um, so because there was limited information uh, in the literature about this i've also kind of included in my review kind of direct usability evaluations of the platforms so i'm just going to be going to the platforms as a new user working through their kind of introductory materials and just getting an idea of what features they have and kind of kind of scoring them against my own criteria um, so in order to kind of decide which platforms I was going to evaluate and what papers I was going to include, I had to kind of uh, come up with my definition of what I mean when I'm talking about platforms like Galaxy. So I'm talking about a workflow management system, which is basically a piece of software that lets you choose between a selection of different tools. It uh, helps you to use them and it gives you kind of ways of linking them together into building your own workflows. Uh, it probably gives you some kind of uh, tools for managing and organizing your workflows. And it also should ideally for users like me take on a lot of kind of the computational decisions about how kind of comp computer resources are being managed, and, like deal with kind of software dependencies and things like this that I as a biologist uh, do not want to have to learn how to, how to do for myself. Um, so when I started reading around the literature, I found that there were a lot of different platforms. There's like a small selection of them here. Like I didn't want to inflict like the whole kind of confusion that faces a new user on you. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm in the preliminary stages of evaluating these platforms. So I've kind of focused on the big three, which are Galaxy, Snakebake and Nextflow. These are the ones that come up a lot when you're kind of looking uh, through the literature as like people have used them in their analyses or they've developed tools for them. So I kind of wanted to start off by um, evaluating these ones so that I can kind of refine the criteria that I'm going to use uh, to evaluate other platforms. Um, so in order to uh, evaluate them, I kind of uh, developed my own uh, series of seven key characteristics or criteria that, I, that kind of emerged from the literature as being really important to users when they're choosing or using a platform. So first off, accessibility. Can I actually perceive and interact with the uh, interface? or can I uh, be sure that all of my students or all of my employees are going to be able to access the interface? Sustainability, if I learn how to use the platform now, am I still gonna be able to use it next year or in five years? Um, or am I gonna have to learn another platform because uh, this one has disappeared? Reproducibility, um, how easy is it going to be for me to reuse my workflows and to give them to other people to kind of either try to replicate my analysis as closely as possible or to reproduce it in a slightly different environment with their own data sets? Fairness, um, are the data and the workflows that I'm producing going to meet the fair criteria? Are they going to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable? Usability, so um, in terms of my criteria, what I'm defining this as is kind of how quickly can I get started using this platform? And, um, you know, what sort of features does it give me to organise my workflows? And what happens when there's an error? How good is it, is it at helping me to fix that? 
And then learnability, like how much of a learning curve is there for me to start running my own analyses on it and what sorts of training materials are available. And so you can see I've run out of room here and I promised you seven characteristics, but that is, that is all part of the plan because the seventh one is a little bit different, so we'll get back to that a bit later. Because for each of these six uh, characteristics, I was able to give them a score from one to five based on how well they achieved it. So the kind of the simplest one was sustainability. So if you've got a score of one for this, it was a, 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 a newly developed platform, one that hadn't been updated recently. Whereas a score of five then meant that it was a platform that was more than five years old, but had been updated recently and was also had kind of an active community. So you could kind of rely on it to still be around in the future. And for each of these characteristics, I gave each platform a score, which I then plotted on these little spider web diagrams and then uh, kind of added a line, which kind of gives you a kind of a visual representation of which areas that platform was doing well in. So uh, the first uh, ones I evaluated, NextFlow and StateMake, which actually ended up with identical uh, <laughs> plots on my criteria, so I might need to refine them in order to differentiate between them a little bit. Um, but basically, uh, for a user like me, these are very similar platforms, because they're both kind of text-based workflow editors where you're typing in, this is the input I want to use, this is the output I want you to generate, and this is uh, kind of the uh, tool that I want you to use to do that. And you kind of string together these like, lists of processes or rules into making a workflow. And they do kind of offer various kind of tools to help you produce reports about which tools and versions you use to kind of help, help with reproducibility and things like that. Um, so for Galaxy, it turned out uh, a similar kind of shape because I think a lot of these platforms don't score that highly on accessibility. Um, but you can see when I overlay this one on kind of the inner ring there is like the snake make and next flow plot, the outer one is Galaxy. So you can say, well, Galaxy is doing better on some of these platforms, particularly on kind of um, criteria on the left side, like learnability and usability. Um, because the interface is so different when you're using Galaxy, you're, you're pointing and clicking on things, you're entering a limited number of parameters. And then kind of the key thing for me is there's not this huge learning curve of having to learn a new language and having to learn how to interact with the interface. Because a lot of the training materials you get for Snake, Make and Nextflow is basically telling you what do you have to type in in order to make this happen. Whereas when you're on the Galaxy training network, you have some introductory um, tutorials that kind of introduce you to the interface, but a lot of them are actually about the biology. Like these are the analysis you can produce, the sorts of results you can get and uh, how you can interpret them. And as a biologist, that's what I really want to be learning. I don't want to be kind of bogged down in the details of what I'm typing into things. Um, so you might think, well, this is like the answer to the question of why you should use Galaxy. It's clearly scoring higher on some of these criteria, but it's not quite that simple because these criteria don't always matter um, to equal amounts to every sort of user. So if you are an educator, then having kind of higher accessibility and learnability ratings is going to be really important for you. So Galaxy is clearly a good choice for you. But if you are a researcher who's quite experienced in bioinformatics, you might not care so much about those criteria. You might really only be interested in sort of the sustainability, reproducibility and fairness. And on that, these three platforms basically score the same. So it's kind of difficult for you to make your choice. This is where the seventh characteristic that I promised you kind of might come into play. So the seventh one, I'm kind of calling it a uh, sort of gradient between flexibility and support. And the reason why I haven't included this on the plot with the other ones is that it's a little bit different. Because whereas on the other ones, you can say one side of the scale is bad and one side is good. On this one, I don't think you can say the same because it really depends on who you are and what you want to do. If you are a kind of experienced bioinformatician, you have like really good programming skills, you don't want to get in there behind the scenes and decide how things are being managed and to, um, kind of adapt or develop your own tools, then something like NextFlow or SnakeMake is really going to be beneficial for you because they're designed for people who want to kind of take charge, make their own decisions, and really kind of get in there and adapt things. And you might think, well, flexibility, that sounds great. Like that's clearly the positive end of this scale. But that's not always the case because for users like me, like having too much flexibility is kind of too much of a responsibility for me. And it really um, makes me have to make more decisions than I need to be making. If I just want to run a standard, um, tool and kind of set a few parameters to kind of adjust it for my um, data, then having kind of too many decisions to make and having too many things to type in just increases my chances of making an error and then having to go back and try to find it and fix it. Whereas when I'm working in Galaxy, it kind of, it, I have a much more um, kind of support in kind of, you only have to make a few kind of decisions on parameters and there's usually kind of guidance as to which range you might want to use for them. So you kind of, you feel like you have a much stronger safety net underneath you to kind of prevent you from making unnecessary errors and kind of to, to support you when something does go wrong. And you also obviously have, again, training materials so you can, so you can kind of, um, you know, 
develop your own uh, workflows and analyses and adapt things without having to kind of think about all the things that biologists don't really want to be spending their time on. You can really just pinpoint what you're what you're interested in. Um, so I think, unfortunately, there's no kind of simple answer as to like why you should use Galaxy rather than another one, because it really does depend on what you're interested in doing. Like, um, you know, for some users, they do want to, they just enjoy programming and they enjoy coding and typing things in and, uh, or they kind of really need that flexibility and they do want to be working in something like Next or State Make. Uh, whereas kind of the, I think biologists and students then getting started in Galaxy is a lot um, easier for us. And it kind of, it does uh, allow us to make the decisions that we need to make without kind of forcing us to, to kind of think about, about the uh, things that we're not, not really needing to, to change in our analyses. Um, so my next steps for the review is to kind of perform usability evaluations of more platforms. And while I'm doing that, I want to refine these criteria so that they can be quite sort of useful, um, like measures of, uh, for comparing these platforms and kind of with the ultimate aim of sort of creating guidelines to help other people in the future to reevaluate them as the platforms change, like whether they're kind of users who want to choose a platform for their students or for their own research, or potentially even for like some of the people who work on developing platforms like Galaxy, like maybe it will kind of help you to kind of understand what uh, like biologists like me actually <laughs> kind of need from me. Um, so I'd just like to finish by uh, thanking my supervisor, Wendy Bacon, who is uh, the person who made me start using Galaxy and also the GCC fellowship for enabling me to come here and talk to you all in person. Um, I'll be taking part in the poster session after this. So if anyone does want to kind of share their opinions on Galaxy and other work for management with me, I'd be very happy to talk to you. Um, but I think we do have time for some questions now, if uh, anyone has any. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marisa, for this great overview. Uh, we have a first question coming up from Anton. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, I would love to um, have these graphs because, you know, they're very helpful for grant proposals, for example. <laughs> uh, but uh, another thing, I would also advise you to look at the GitHub stats, for example, number of contributors, because that yes. looks very different. And you should also consider commercial things like DNA yeah. Nexus or Seven Bridges, or whatever it's called right now. Uh, because it's it's sort of it's also important uh, okay. to understand why, for example, some people prefer commercial products because yeah, they have this yeah. uh, strange idea that if they pay for something, it's better. But we do need to understand uh, what yeah. they do because they do a lot of things well as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good advice because I think I think of it more as like a student. So we're always looking for free things, whereas like if you are like yeah, a, an employer or, or a commercial like company, you're probably do you appreciate things that you pay for a bit more? <laughs> Hello, we have a question from online uh, from Lucille. It is, what could you suggest to Galaxy developers to improve accessibility? Um, so I think uh, the accessibility of Galaxy is kind of higher than for the text-based ones already, just because it is this online interface. I think some of the problems are kind of easily solvable because when you run like an accessibility analysis like the Google Lighthouse one on the website, you can see that some of the issues are just that it's missing kind of certain tags and things that screen readers need. Um, I think as well, like um, just the idea that for a lot of what you do on Galaxy, you can either choose to use the keyboard or the mouse. Um, and that's kind of a big thing. Just to give people options is kind of a big plus for accessibility. So um, um, like I think someone was talking about the workflows yesterday and how you can now kind of use like the space bar and things like that and the tab uh, button to move between them. So I think it would be great if that could become a feature where you can do the whole like workflow editing thing just using your keyboard or using your mouse. Like that's kind of the sort of things that you're looking for in accessibility is just options for people to choose from if they kind of prefer or have different accessibility needs. Thank you very much for answering the questions. If we have no more questions, I think we can finish on time and move on to our next speaker. So thank you, Marisa, very much for your very interesting talk. Thank you. Next, we have Julia Jacquiela, who is going to tell us about her journey from being a new user to becoming a training community contributor. 
Right, so hi everyone. Um, I'm here today to um, talk you through my journey from a new user to training community contributor. I am aware that most of you are already very advanced in using Galaxy, but just to give you some flashbacks of how it was at the beginning. So um, me as a new user, um, new newcomer to Galaxy, um, I am still studying medicine and biological chemistry but I'm a self-taught coding fan, and I like combining different fields. Um, I was lucky enough to get some funding to develop some tutorials and to come here to speak to you in Australia. Um, so just to point out some features that I think are quite important for um, newbies, obviously GTN with so many tutorials on so many topics, uh, with those amazing questions, boxes, as well as uh, different snippets which um, accelerate learning and make it easier. Also requirement section, which guides the user through um, the tutorial series, and now it's even easier with the learning pathways. Um, also, the open and inclusive Galaxy community, which is um, um, which is always uh, happy to help and answer any questions on the different platforms. Um, so the next step from the new user would be to identify the gaps within the field. Um, and in my case, um, those gaps were, for example, existing tools in a tool shed, but no tutorials associated. Um, then um, there might be users' needs for specific tools or specific um, analysis method but no tutorials explaining how to do it actually. Um, or um, it could be also the aim for creating tutorials for users on different levels uh, for those preferring Galaxy buttons as well as uh, using the console. Um, so here we come to the point when we can actually break this user developer wall. And um, well, for me, um, I think all this, what is needed is this curiosity and enthusiasm because Galaxy GTN uh, actually has lots of tutorials that can actually bring you from a user to developer. Um, of course, computing background might be helpful, is actually helpful, um, but you just have to enjoy it. Um, well, in my opinion, it was worth getting involved because you can feel uh, fulfillment, you can feel the satisfaction when you can share the knowledge and passion with others and use your programming skills in a creative way. Um, and obviously I started from small things such as testing tutorials, um, updating them, upgrading them with uh, new features um, to finally be able to become an author of tutorials and slide decks. Um, so in my way, I found it very useful to be able to reproduce the existing analysis from the code to Galaxy buttons and other way around. And it's especially helpful when we want to produce the tutorials for users who don't really like Galaxy buttons and prefer um, uh, interacting with the console. Um, and obviously on my way, I um, faced a lot of problems. So there was a lot of troubleshooting on the way. Usually people only see the PR open and the tutorial published. However, there is a lot of issue that you have to solve. Um, so developing a tutorial is like an iceberg and you have to uh, go through a lot of rep histories to actually develop a tutorial that works. Um, and what I found very, very useful was the contributing to Galaxy tutorials, which um, taught me how to write a tutorial in Markdown so that it's rendered nicely, um, how to test tutorials using Gitpod, and also how to test workflows. Um, so that finally led me to the point that I could make my very first contribution to GTN. And I want to um, stress here that for me, it was very important to have someone above me uh, who would give a review because I was very afraid that I will break Galaxy uh, with my first uh, PR. Um, and yeah, after that, you can call yourself a tutorial developer, which is exciting. Um, and it might sound like a success story, but yeah, not everything work, uh, works at first. Uh, so there's a lot of troubleshooting, which takes lots of time. Um, and um, serendipity is also needed to be successful. Um, 
And what kept me on the track was, as I mentioned, um, the help from Galaxy community, which is amazing. Uh, my lovely supportive supervisor, thank you, Wendy. <laughs> um, and trying to alternative routes. When something doesn't work, you just have to try something else. And uh, of course, motivation to keep on going. Um, <laughs> And uh, here's the expected timeline um, for this kind of journey. Um, for me, it took eight weeks full-time internship uh, to develop a tutorial and a slide deck from complete um, newcomer. And it, of course, depends on your programming and biological background. Um, so finally, Galaxy opens many doors to further de development. And for me, that was, for example, becoming a trainer for summer sport and for EBI courses um, and starting new projects. So now I'm just looking to um, develop even more um, in new fields or developing tools. And uh, last but not least, um, during this journey, I learned how important is the community development and how important is it to have this communication between user training developers and tools developers so that we can actually maintain this kind of galaxy circle of life. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer if we have any time left. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. One question? Yeah, I think we have time for one question. Is there a question? No question online? Oh, okay, Anton. Do you think it would be a good idea to establish some kind of an editor-in-chief for GTN, sort of a person who would read all these things and essentially almost have like an editorial process for new tutorials where you know they get submitted reviewed and so on and then they're published do you think it's a good idea well i think it's kind of like unofficially stated um but it having someone who reviews your tutorials and has a broad overview of what is available in galaxy would be very useful because we could improve tutorials um that are just newly developed by advanced, like introducing some advances that new users, new developers are not necessarily aware of. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think our next speakers don't need a lot of introduction. If there is someone to be entitled as editor-in-chief of the GTN, it's them. So please welcome Helena and Saskia. Thank you. So uh, I'm Saskia, and together with Helena, we'll do our traditional uh, update of the GTN talk. Um, so for anyone who might be new here this year, a very quick uh, introduction to what the GTN is. So this started uh, in 2016. Before that, we were, there was no real structure. A lot of us were using um, Galaxy to, to teach, uh, but we were all doing our own things. We were not communicating. So I had like a PDF with a, a transcriptomics tutorial somewhere. Um, someone else had the same thing almost in, in their Word document. So in 2016, Berenice Batu from Freiburg decided, no, we need to organize this, get a um, central repository and work together. And uh, so yeah, I immediately thought this was a good idea. So I jumped on that and, um, uh, a little bit later, Helena came along and was like, hey, you could automate a lot of this stuff. So she really helped us sort of to improve the infrastructure there. So at first, we really focused on like getting these tutorials um, together uh, and making it easy for people to, to find them and learn from them. Uh, so we published this. And then afterwards, we're like, OK, we need to uh, really focus on how to make this um, good for teaching, for in education, whether you're running um, a master's curriculum or whether you're um, educating your uh, your researchers um so we focus more on that then of course the pandemic happened so we're like okay now we really need to like get on to like how do we do this remotely um so our our focus changed again so we have two papers one came out recently if you want to read more about this and of course the three of us just lead this but most of it is by the community so we have over 300 contributors who helped with these tutorials, who wrote, wrote tutorials, or helped with the infrastructure, 
or just kept them up to date or tested them, all of that. And we have a bunch of topic maintainers who are sort of this editor in chief type thing for a topic. Um, yeah, so this is it training.galaxyproject.org. Go there if you want to learn how to do data analysis in Galaxy. Um, like I said, this is really a community driven project uh, by the community for the community. We now have 37 topics, uh, 358 tutorials, and every time I present the slide, it's already out of date, uh, no matter how recently I made it. Uh, we have lots of FAQs, yeah, 309 contributors, but it's already out of date, and it's been going on for, uh, for eight years. And every tutorial is really meant to be sort of a hands-on journal article. So a lot of these also really literally follow a scientific article that was recently published and takes you through it, gives you all the background, um, and tells you what to do in Galaxy to reproduce this. So it's structured like a paper. It has all the authors, editors. It starts with some metadata, like, OK, what is the purpose of this, learning objectives, um, and um, other things you may need. Um, some have slides to really familiarize you with the, the background. Uh, question and answer boxes. So for teaching, again, this is very useful to sort of test your students' comprehension. And of course, we want you to get credit. So every contributor has this page that lists everything you've done. So you can really show off um, to the people who might uh, not see the amount of work you put into this. And every tutorial can be cited too if people use it um, for their analysis. Okay, quickly into teaching with the Galaxy ecosystem. So Galaxy, we think, is a fantastic platform for teaching and training. Oftentimes when we talk about this, we use the phrasing of like, okay, we're not teaching Galaxy, we're teaching bioinformatics. We're using Galaxy, but we're teaching bioinformatics. It really takes away a lot of the complicated portions of working with your data, working with your analyses, running workflows, so you can actually focus on the science. That's what we always want to do, focus on the science, how we can teach these concepts of what's an assembler, what's a tool. Um, so Galaxy is fantastic. We love it. You can just bring a web browser. It's great for teaching. There are a lot of supportive resources for teaching with Galaxy across the ecosystem. Of course, the crazy number of GTN tutorials and FAQs. These are fantastic resources for support staff who are helping people with issues when they have to learn to do things like rename data sets, change data types, page types in a collection. We have FAQs that you can easily link to that say, here, this is how you do this step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, we also have the video library, of course, which is a new addition as of the pandemic, really, and it's grown quite large. I forget if we have a slide on that, but we have something like 116 hours of videos that are a combination of human recorded and automated videos. Galaxy itself, of course, has a lot of features for teaching, including data libraries, which make it really easy for you to put all of your teaching and training data in one place. We attempt to have a GTN teaching or data library that encompasses all of the data sets that are used without the, throughout the GTN into one place where you can easily quickly import them on any of the used galaxy.star servers. We also have, of course, the click to run tools and click to run workflows. These are the workflows are a new feature this year. Um, this is all part of the tutorial mode. So when you go to Galaxy and you click on the little hat icon, you activate tutorial mode, and then you can easily interact with the tutorial in a more like direct, interactive way, saying, okay, I'm going to launch a tool, I'm going to launch a workflow. And of course, TS has been fantastic. So TS is a community project from a lot of the sysadmins across Galaxy and funders saying, how can we provide all of these cool resources that we have and make them available and more available for teaching? So TS training infrastructure is a service. It makes it really easy to run a dedicated job queue for individual training events that all of your users go to Galaxy. They get the same Galaxy that they'd use otherwise. So you can really easily migrate users from I am a learner into I am an actual user. They all, it all happens on the same Galaxy. They have access to all of their same data sets and resources. It really makes that continuum quite easy. There's a nice form. This is the old version of the form. I think Cameron has made it look a lot nicer. Thank you, Cameron. We really appreciate that. Uh, you, get, you fill out this form. You get a nice link. People click the link. They're in the TIOS group. Um, very easy. You don't have to do anything. As a teacher, you don't have to collect their email addresses, their Galaxy identities, anything like that. And for educators, of course, is the TIOS dashboard. This has made remote teaching really fantastically easy, I think. It, in the old world, we would go around the room and we'd say, okay, are you done? Are you done? You know, we'd look over people's shoulders to say, have you finished this step? And now we can just check a website and we see immediately that everyone's done. It's made draining a lot faster for us as well. As of 2018, 
we started TIAS, and since then we've had 508 events across the four main TIAS instances, covering 143 countries. We have a nice paper, you should go read it. We finally got it published after six months, um, and it's funded, in theory, 24,000 learners. We think that number is roughly accurate. It's a fast, fantastic number of people who've been helped by all this free infrastructure that's available. Ah, oh, yeah, GTN Video Library, 116 hours, as we said. So all of these videos are recordings of instructors teaching their tutorials, teaching their materials, things that they know best. Yeah, it's great. Please use it. We make it easy to embed in your course materials if you are using one of the major course platforms like Blackboard, things like this. There's an easy, like, embed this in your course platform. This has also been wrapped up into the course builder, so if you want to rerun an existing course, we've taught a bunch of online courses these past three years. If you want to rerun or remix one of these, we have a little button that says remix this course, where you can edit the description, you can edit the schedule, add or remove different modules from the library, and get a course. Um, is this one you? Um, yeah, so if you want to learn more about this uh, training infrastructure as a service, TIAS, and how you can use it for your own education, uh, there will be a webinar July 25th in Australian times, um, but I think the, the video will also be available after, so you can watch that and we'll go into more detail. Um, yeah, so now, quickly some new features that we've added this past year that you may or may not know about. Um, so first of all, lots of updates, lots of new tutorials. Um, so we have over 746 PRs merged in the last year. Um, so that's really a lot of uh, new tutorials by you. There's a lot of updates to existing tutorials to make sure they're always uh, up to date with the latest tool versions and the latest state of the art, a lot of infrastructure work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, so one thing I want to highlight is these automated video slides. If you provide a slide deck and you put good um, speaker notes on every slide, uh, and then you just put, say, uh, yes, I want a video made of this. We will use automatic text-to-speech uh, software um, that will create a video, and you will have a voice narrating based on the speaker notes um, with the slides. So it's really a video you can watch. Often this is based on what like real instructors have said during teaching these slide decks. Um, you can even choose your own accent. So if you want an Aussie accent, you can even specify that. And this really makes it easy to keep up to date, because if you record something as a person, the slides change, you have to reinvest that whole time, and this just automatically submit the pull, pull request and the video is updated, so that's great. Uh, learning pathways is also something new, so you may have noticed this new button at the top of Galaxy, uh, learning pathways. So this is really a journey around a topic um, that takes you uh, from multiple um, tutorials around the topic really from nothing to, from zero to hero. So, um, and this is um, across different uh, topics in the GTN. This is often like what you would see if you get like a week long course around single cell, for example, uh, you can go to this page. So whether you want to learn or whether you want to teach and just have like an idea of like, what are other people teaching? Uh, you can go here uh, to get some inspiration. Uh, and if you of course want to add a new learning pathway, this, uh, we're very happy to include it. So if you're teaching already something, courses of a few days or whatever, um, yeah, please just add what you like to do and it'll be uh, useful for others. Uh, choose your own adventure is something you can now do in a tutorial as well. So you can add this sort of a, a choice here. So this is from the RNA seq tutorial and users can choose whether they want to use star for alignment or feature counts or for the counting. And then based on what they click here, the rest of the tutorial will change. So you can also do things like, okay, I wanna use this reference genome or this um, thing, or I use it for like the long version of a tutorial and the short version of a tutorial. Um, so yeah, this is very uh, nice new feature. A tutorial mode was already mentioned. If you click on this hat icon in Galaxy, it'll open the, the GTN inside Galaxy. And the nice thing here is that you can instantly click on this tool name to directly open the tool in Galaxy. And since recently you can do the same with workflows. So you just click on this workflow, it'll import it into Galaxy and open it for you. So you can, again, one click run workflows. Uh, Helena's done some work to improve the tutorial search and every tutorial now also has this persistent identifier. 
Okay, and a quick tour through the accessibility options. So the GTN cares a lot about accessibility. We test with screen readers. We test with uh, colorblindness. I'm colorblind, right? We test under a lot of different circumstances where possible. Uh, we have support for a lot of different impairments. That we're really proud of this, right? All of the automated videos that Saskia mentioned earlier, those have perfect captions, of course. There's no need to manually caption those videos because we know exactly what's being said for them. So fantastic, easy. Uh, we have support for okay cognitive accessibility issues. This doesn't just affect people with those impairments currently, but also all of the rest of us who are maybe not remembering how to do this particular option because we are busy overworked people and we don't remember how to change the data type of a collection, something like this. So we always have these FAQs that maybe people who are confident in their analysis skills don't need these, but there are lots of us who do need them and benefit from them. So we make sure we include them wherever possible. Uh, contributing to the GTN is fantastic and easy. As Julia has told you, okay, maybe it takes eight weeks for someone who isn't new to this. We're trying to <laughs> let us know what makes this easier. We'd be happy to help. We've got lots of events if you want to learn, like the webinar mentioned. We've got lots of features to make your life easier as a contributor. If there are pain points you encounter, we want to know them so we can reduce those barriers to entry. Uh, all of the tutorials have feedback. We would love your feedback on as a teacher, as a student, as a learner. And with that, we would like to acknowledge everyone in the Galaxy community, the Elixir for funding us here at the GTN community. Thank you all. You've made this truly a fantastic resource, not just within Galaxy, but outside of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this amazing review of the GTN history and development. Um, we have a first question. Hey, thanks. Uh, a lot of this really, really cool. Uh, like with the pathways, um, do you have like insights into people using this for complete courses or is there a, a sort of vision for doing courses uh, complete like semester long courses? We don't have any learning pathways. They're currently semester long courses. We'd love to have them. Um, I've taught semester long courses, but they were not completely GTN materials, so we haven't included them. Um, we should do that though, because all of the Python modules that are currently in there in the data science topic, those were created for a semester long Python course. So. Fantastic suggestion. Thank you for the reminder. I will absolutely add that. Um, yeah. The sheets are only like a month old, so hopefully we'll get uh, yeah some input from the community. So please like add your learning pathways. We're really happy to have them. Thank you very much. And we have another question. Can you tell me a little bit about the video, the slides to video feature that you have, and who can use this? And once the videos are created, how can people access this? And can the whole world use this? Because that's a kind of a lot, isn't it? I mean, yeah, there's some competing tech, competing options there that you might want to use. Ours is very deeply integrated into the GTN format. It just takes the slides, it looks at the individual blocks, individual slides, extracts them, it renders them each page by page into a PNG. It renders all of the subtitles or the captions, the speaker notes that are attached to each slide into text or into audio, sorry, combines all of this together. It's really easy. There's nothing terribly complicated in there other than the muxing of all the data together, um, but that's just a bit of FFmpeg. Anyone can use this, of course. Anyone who is contributing to the GTN gets this for free. It does use AWS for the audio and GitHub Actions Minutes, of course, for the compilation of the video. Um, but yes, anyone is welcome to take advantage of this technology. Thank you very much once again. Um, our next speaker is Natalie Kutcher, and she's going to tell us how we can use the Anvil platform in education. So please, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Kutcher. Um, I'm in, uh, at Johns Hopkins University in Mike Schatz's lab. Um, working in a couple of these different groups. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about using Galaxy and Anvil to diversify the genomic data science workforce. Okay, um, so as you all are very well aware, the growth of the genomics field and uh, just the increasing amount of data that are being generated every day provide uh, a lot of opportunities for um, bioinformaticians and data scientists, a lot of these spaces for uh, students to get involved um, with a lot of applications like we heard about yesterday uh, in conservation as well as biomedical research. Um, but traditionally, this hasn't really included uh, folks who are at institutions that don't have access 
uh, don't have funding to sequence their own data and generate data uh, or have resources for storage and compute. Uh, and so being uniquely positioned with Anvil and Galaxy, um, we've organized uh, the Genomic Data Science Community Network, uh, which is a network of faculty at institutions across the United States um, that are at predominantly undergraduate institutions like historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities and community colleges to help to um, provide exposure to genomic data science to students that uh, haven't really had uh, exposure to this before. So the main goals of this network is to uh, introduce these faculty to one another. They often face very similar barriers so to do this knowledge sharing for how to um, overcome these issues that they encounter expand their access to resources and data through Galaxy and Anvil, as well as developing educational resources, which I'm going to focus on today. Um, since these faculty have a lot of responsibilities, um, have a lot uh, of things that they need to do, um, helping to create materials that they can reuse um, and uh, share across the network is really a big goal. Uh, so we published a paper uh, last year about this. If you'd like to learn more, please check it out. Uh, so like I mentioned, a main goal here is for faculty to contribute the um, exercises that they've developed that they use with their students um, to the Genomic Data Science Community Network. We have folks who will adapt this material to run an anvil. Uh, and then this is something that we continually test and maintain over time to um, support its use in the classroom. One example is this uh, activity, SARS-CoV-2 variant detection using Galaxy and Anvil. This was developed by Robert Meller, who's at Morehouse School of Medicine and one of the members of the GDSCN, uh, and adapted by Ava Hoffman, who's part of the Anvil Outreach Team at the Fred Hutch. Uh, so really the key goals of this activity are to introduce students to basic genomics concepts, uh, introduce them a little bit to computing and bioinformatics, uh, and then give them this like uh, authentic experience of discovery uh, so in this example, students align viral sequence uh, data to a reference and can visually uh, identify the Delta variant in the virus. So we've adapted this activity to run in Anvil, uh, which has been used in uh, a lot of really cool uh, uh, research activities lately, like the telomere to telomere consortium um, completion of the human genome. Uh, as well as the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium. So giving students this really authentic research experience using resources that the top researchers in the world also use. Uh, so the materials that we've developed as part of this, uh, there are a number of lecture videos that cover some of those introductory genomics concepts and computing concepts. Uh, we've also developed a student activity guide um, that our outreach team uses. And thanks to Helena, as of last night, we've been able to convert this also into a GTN tutorial. So really excited to contribute uh, that to the GTN as well. Um, so one, I think, of the main ways that we can continue further integrating uh, these resources that we're developing um, is to uh, add an arm to this fun robot otter that's been developed by the Anvil Outreach Group. Uh, which stands for Open Source Tools for Training Resources. Uh, so this will automatically push the content that we develop to a number of uh, publishing and MOOC platforms. Um, and I think that uh, adding an arm that will also automatically uh, add these tutorials to the GTN is going to uh, really nicely integrate our efforts uh, with making these resources accessible to students um, uh, to also freely run on uh, Galaxy as well as Anvil, which we're uh, providing resources for the educators to use. So future connections with Galaxy, like I mentioned, we want to integrate Otter uh, to push uh, and publish to the Galaxy Training Network tutorials. Um, and then also we'd love to further involve the GDSCN with the Galaxy community. Uh, as we heard in the last talk, uh, this uh, and the others earlier today, I think there are really nice ways to collaborate with these groups. Um, involve them more in smorgasbord and GT, uh, MGCC. Um, a lot of the folks are also uh, really keen on um, making connections with other researchers, so uh, trying to identify the communities of practice that are most applicable to them. Uh, and then encouraging also you all to partner with the GDSCI yeah, to help support them in uh, this uh, endeavor to expose students to genomic data science and provide pathways for them to continue.
So with that, I want to thank uh, the GDSCN, uh, folks on the Anvil team, and, G uh, and the whole Gal Galaxy community. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Yeah, is there? Yeah, oh, sorry. Thank you. How do you manage uh, personally identifiable information uh, within this uh, environment? Yeah, so uh, Anvil is a cloud-based platform that runs on uh, Google Cloud. And so uh, with this, on top of GCP, uh, Anvil is built on uh, Terra. And so they've undergone um, FedRAMP authorization to, um, to be able to securely handle uh, protected human uh, genomic data sets. Um, I think there are additional processes that need to, uh, and certifications that it needs to undergo to handle um, more sensitive clinical data. Um, but at this point, uh, this FedRAMP authorization in the United States um, certifies this platform to handle human genomics data. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Sarah Williams from QCIF, um, who is collaborating with a core facility to build research scale workflows. So please, Sarah. Cool. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be chatting about some experiences we've had um, working with a core facility to develop workflows in conjunction with them, uh, talking about the sort of uh, challenges and this we've encountered and the solutions we've kind of tried out. Um, so what the situation was is that uh, the Griffith Central Facility for Genomics, um, they've started, they've been getting some more machines, um, sequencing facility, and you know, they're, they're looking to establish some pipelines um, to process their data to share with the to sort of value add to the people, the users of the facility uh, all around. So, you know, they've seen Galaxy, they're not Galaxy users, but they're interested and they're quite willing to, um, you know, see this as a good solution. So, the goal of this project was to develop these practical pipelines for the routine processing of some metagenomics and single cell RNA-seq data. Um, and the kind of stakeholders involved this, of course, are the Griffith uh, facility people, um, as users, um, and then there's um, people from uh, Griffith, sorry, from um, QCIF, so myself, we're involved in the workflow development side of things. And then also the goal with this work is to make this more broadly reusable and um, useful for the wider community around um, Galaxy Australia. So one of the first challenges we hit was actually we didn't have a pipeline in place. So this was all very, very new and where are we gonna start? So this is where the Galaxy Training Network is like a lifesaver because it's like, oh, where do we start? Oh, okay, well, we're starting there and we can adapt that kind of stuff into do what we need to do. Um, and, you know, trying out tools and all of that sort of stuff is just a matter of time. Um, and yeah, solutions for this was obviously communication, super important. Um, and, you know, sticking with those sort of toolkits that are already in Galaxy that do suitable tasks getting support from Galaxy folk and, you know, the broader Galaxy community. Uh, another challenge um, was, you know, when you know roughly what you want to do, making it work end to end. Um, so, you know, we, the issues, we, you know, sometimes the tool we wanted wasn't available on Galaxy Australia, so we needed the support for, from, you know, the Galaxy Australia team to, you know, can we please install this tool and, you know, tool wrapping and that kind of thing. Um, another thing that I want to touch on is that as a bioinformatician, um, some of the Galaxy programming logic, and I am saying programming logic deliberately, it can feel a little bit awkward um, when you, like an example, when you've got um, a series of, um, you know, results, columns of data for different uh, samples, and you just want to join them all together in one big table. I'm in R, I'm like, oh yeah, C-bind, done. Um, in Galaxy, you really have to sort of think about the steps involved in, like, making that collection, getting your names, joining it all together and testing what you've done. Um, it's, it's a matter of perception, but it's just one of those challenges that you do hit. Um, and yet you are a little bit more removed from the debugging facilities because 
you don't have the machine directly access to the machine you're using. Um, and the solution there was obviously a lot of support that we received from you know, Galaxy Australia folks, the online Galaxy community, all of the useful you know, help that really enabled this kind of, to get over these hurdles. Um, and yeah, no, no workflow is really useful unless you understand what it's doing and you, know, you, can, you can drive it. So these things really need to be uh, documented appropriately, shared. We've tried, to, we've tried to sort of use all these good resources available through the Galaxy community. Uh, you know, the inbuilt reporting, uh, workflow hub hosting, and you know, just documenting things. Um, and again, there was the support um, involved in getting this to work. So you can see I've said support several times because that is really the rig solution for, you know, that is what having that little bit of hand holding sometimes um, is what has enabled this project to sort of get as far, get this far. Um, and yeah, I just want to say there's this real appetite for using um, Galaxy in, um, you know, a context like this to produce these kind of workflows for, for use, routine use. Um, and, you know, the framework's there, so that's right. Um, if you're interested, there are some links. We're kind of actively, yes, we're approaching version one, so it's still a little bit actively developed, but um, there's some information there. Um, and lastly, just to everybody who's been involved in this project, um, especially Ahmed and Valentin have been working, have been developing the shotgun and 16S metagenomics um, workflows. Um, Mike, who's been wrapping uh, Cell Ranger for Galaxy, and um, Amanda, who's been our contact at Griffith Uni, who's been testing all of this stuff and really helping, like the discussions and very <laughs> lots. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. We have time for questions. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, first, Marius. <laughs> this time, sorry, he's going to get first. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that really, um, you know, thinking about workflows in Galaxy is a little different than thinking about workflows like that you edit in the command line and the sample tracking is yeah. different. Um, do you see a I mean, maybe we can also discuss this later, but do you see a way to um, make that logic a bit more digestible? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know enough about the inner workings of Galaxy to, to, to understand. I think sometimes it's a matter of the, the, the way a tool is wrapped. Um, you, you know, if it takes a collection and outputs only a collection or if it takes a collection and outputs like a summary file, um, yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's a tool wrapping on a tool level. Um, is this in production already? Do you have some feedback from users? Not yet. OK. <laughs> See. OK, if I can sneak in one more question from my side. Um, what has been your experience on using Galaxy Australia as sort of the institutional processing platform? Did you consider using like a custom Galaxy that is integrated and built in in your facility? Um, well, yeah, so they, that just doesn't know because the Galaxy Australia platform is kind of there for um, Australia and should be used. Um, and yeah, we just didn't have the, the compute within the group already to be using that. So that was one of the big calls of Galaxy um, Australia is that, you know, it is provided for Australian users. Okay, um, yeah. Then do we have more questions, questions online? All right, <laughs> if we have time, yeah, sure, why not? So for uh, debugging things, um, are you, I mean, you, you mentioned that the debugging is a little complicated. Um, one could imagine that admins get different uh, permissions and could, for instance, um, enter a running job uh, on, on a shell terminal or something like this. Is that something that would help this or um, do, do you have other ideas for like how the debugging could be made easier? Um, yeah, so one of the, so a particular example with the debugging thing, um, knowing the, I think maybe having access to the actual singularity container or, you know, VM, I'm, again, I'm showing my ignorance here, that's actually running the commands um, because sometimes it's like, oh, actually, I think it's, was an example where it thought, okay, maybe this is due to an underlying library of the, yeah. that's used by the Python package that's wrapped. 
that might be wrong and causing an error, but or maybe I you know you just get like a script to to redo it on your machine or something. Like yeah, that. well, it's just one of those ones that you you run that exact command and it yeah. gets different. Thank you very much. And um, with that, I think it is time to close the session. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation.